All right, my name is Stefan Piescher. I'm the CTO at Constant Contact, and this is going to be a little bit of a different talk. And it has to do with the fact that our problems are a lot more trivial than some of the things presented here, which is good because I'm not as smart as a lot of people here in this room. <laughs> so this talk is going to be a little bit about how we at Constant Contact actually use a lot of these technologies that are being presented here, that are being talked about, being trashed on. And so this is a little bit of our story of how we have grown up and how we solve our scaling needs. So before we get started on what we're actually doing, we should go back just very briefly and where we're coming from because that explains a little bit why we made certain choices the way we did this. So in 2009, Constant Contact was very much a single product company using JTE, DB2, WebSphere was really the only two tools developers had. And it was a very monolithic and vertical scaling application, right? So monolithic, specifically the data tier, and we'll talk about data here today, was, well, we needed more performance, we bought a bigger, bigger database server, right? Or a faster SAN. We need more storage, buy a bigger SAN. And so up to this point in time, uh, this was a completely appropriate solution for constant contact. And we should never forget this, right? We talk all about very sophisticated systems here. But the reality is, we should always worry about what's the appropriate solution for the problem we're actually trying to solve. At this point in time, though, Constant Contact had reached a point where we said, well, so we got this, right? And, but we want to be a multi-product company. We want to go even faster. We want to have hundreds of thousands of customers. And how do we really get there, right? So more products, acquisitions, more and more customers. And at the same time, well, this DB2 thing and this, this big expensive SAN is getting really, really expensive. So we need something more like this, right? And you heard earlier from the Facebook guys, the, the distributed systems talk, which is what we all do at some point in time as we scale, right? We try to have a smaller system, more smaller building blocks that you can scale horizontally. All right. So the first thing before we actually got to the data tier is we really built, said, okay, we set a completely new technology strategy, right? We want to be, instead of one gigantic build with two lines of code at once for 45 minutes, we want to have an SOA, right? And in our case, SOA is a little overloaded. It's really a restful JSON-based architecture. And it allowed us to reduce the time to market for what we do from 18 to six months. And it's much more complex, right? So you go from 10 deployables to 110. And then comes the data problem, right? And how do we scale data? And before we talk about how do we scale, what does scale actually mean at Constant Contact? So the last 60 seconds of this talk, we sent 800,000 emails, had 300,000 opens across those emails, had created 1,000 landing pages, had 50,000 requests to OER applications, 30,000 requests just to the contact management system, which is part of this talk here, which is a big part of what we do. Had 1,000 users log in and insert or delete 2,500 images. Now the Facebook guy's gonna say, you <laughs> whatever, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but keep in mind, we're not Facebook, right? We are a much smaller company, and so this is a little bit more pragmatic approach to how do you solve these problems. All right, scaling data. What does this mean at Constant Contact, really? So we have several large data sets, and it says three when you see four, but so it starts with our customers, which is not a really large data set, but it's important. We have about 600,000 customers, a little more than that today, ever growing, right? Uh, on the content side, those customers create two billion individual pieces of content over the life cycle in a rolling window, which is all the emails, all the Facebook posts they create. Hey, shout out to Facebook. Um, to, uh, Twitter posts and everything else to really use to market their small businesses. Um, they have a total of four billion contact records across our system. And then there are the events, and this is one of the things we talk about how, to, how we scaled this is, so every single email sent, email open, clicks, Facebook posts, Twitter posts, likes, all these things are recorded in the system that we use, first of all, to keep track of it, so we don't want to lose anything. And second of all, uh, for reporting and analytics purposes on behalf of our customers. And that's a system that's a little bit more interesting, right? Because it has about 100 billion rows in it. 
And so um, what did we do? So we started out like this, right? This is the big gigantic database I was talking about. And actually, in reality, it was really more like this. There was one big one and seven little smaller ones. But it came pretty clear that um, very monolithic data architecture has limitations, let's put it this way. And you heard a lot of talks today about Facebook's graphs and how they distributed data and some very, very smart stuff. And um, here's our story of this. So we started with those seven major databases, massive Sun servers with 64 CPUs. Back then it was big, right? And a million dollar sand attached to it, and then they had us times two. We have a production site and a DR site. So pretty expensive for, for our terms back then. And so the data architecture is always the hardest thing to scale, right? And you heard a lot about this today. So Facebook improved their effectiveness and efficiency by 50% by being smart about how they distribute a graph uh, across the distributed systems. It's even harder when you start out with a very monolithic architecture that assumes that up till now all the data is in one place, right? And now you all of a sudden put it in many places. Now you have to teach all your applications. Well, if you look for this customer's data, it's over here. If you look for this contact, it's over there. So how do you really do this without having to rewrite lots and lots and lots of code? And it's hard to tell as well if you grow up in like constant contact like any startup company, you get this, you don't really know who is actually touching the data anymore. And so introducing data shutting after effect is a lot of world work. <laughs> and um, DB2 had no horizontal sharding capabilities at the time. And on top of it, if you ever worked with commercial databases of the IBM or Oracle brand, um, you will of, of course have learned that horizontal scalability is not really, they love to sell you many more licenses, right? But for us, that gets very, very, very expensive. So, sharding pros and cons, pretty trivial, right? So it's somewhat predictable at scale, aside from figuring out how to balance it properly, right? But it's difficult to introduce, and it's hard to manage if you have many, many shards, and it's not always cost effective. And so in our case, and again, thanks to our friends at Facebook, Cassandra was a big deal for us very, very early on. Because we looked at, at our data that lived in those very large databases and said, okay, so there really, there's a lot of data and it's actually not even relational, right? So that the content data or the events data at the end of the day is more like key value store. And so we looked very early to Cassandra as one of the primary solutions to our problems here. And uh, we started out with version 0 0.7 and I actually think back of this, and I think it's actually pretty remarkable for a public company to bet on technology that has a zero in their version number. <laughs> and so, uh, but we're very, very careful about this, right? So you build the cluster, you order the data, you have dual writes and reads, and you figure out, is it really working properly? We partnered with uh, now data stacks back then, Reptano, that really provide the support and the services for this. And John is absolutely right, it's great to be in that business. All right, why did we pick Cassandra? High performance, transparent sharding, right? Just going back to how do you shard a previously monolithic architecture? Well, Cassandra looks to the outside world like one gigantic data store, right? And so the way the uh, hashing works in a, in a Cassandra ring, you don't really know or care about how this works underneath the hood. It looks like one gigantic database. Horizontally scalable, right? We've done this once so far. If you need more capacity, whether it's storage or whether it's I.O., you just keep adding nodes. Fault tolerance, so we are a big fan of nothing shared architectures, right? Because specifically if you have a horizontal system, uh, any piece failing and you're not having to worry about it is a good thing, right? Specifically if you have limited resources like, like us. Multi-data center support, right? So we have two data centers, the primary and the DR side, and as we go to more an active-active scenario, right, uh, we like things like Cassandra because, well, guess what? Multi-master replication across the country actually works. And so if you ever try to do multi-master MySQL uh, across the WAN, that's uh, a little sketchy at times. Um, 
And it's cost effective, actually, right? And we'll talk about that in a second, too. Um, and we replaced the DB2 and the SAN with a million dollars uh, per data center with a 17-node Cassandra cluster that spans two data centers for a quarter of a million dollars. So that speaks to the cost effectiveness. And we'll say, well, again, for Facebook, that may not matter, but it matters for us. Okay, so what does it look like today at Constant Contact? So we have two major Cassandra clusters uh, that are not only different key spaces if you know about Cassandra, but they're actually physical separate clusters, right? One is for the content and one is for the event tracking. We started out with 36 nodes on either side using a local quorum, um, three nodes in each data center, so you get six copies of the same data. Let's go back, this is really cost effective, but it's commodity hardware, right? It's like cheap servers with local drives, uh, nothing special. And so pretty recently, we needed more capacity, so we just added nodes to our tracking cluster, and it was actually an I.O. problem, it wasn't even a storage problem. So we added nodes, waited a little while until everything rebalanced, and it worked exactly as advertised, and eventually everything settled down again, and things worked the way it's supposed to. So Cassandra was a, was a huge success story for us. Uh, we're using it more and more for all the things that are less relational in their nature, and um, it works really well. All right, results. So reduced, reduced cost by the percent, had no major outages so far, right? If you have a monolithic database, ever, anybody ever live in that world? Any small blip takes everything down? Uh, no more. And not only a tenth of the cost, but really almost ten times the performance. Um, distributed systems usually work much better, right? And so and it allowed, really allowed us to use cases that we couldn't do before, right? Um, so now, before that, we could store 90 days worth of rolling windows of all of these events in detail I talked about. Now we're storing four years of this data and over 100 billion records. The second data problem we had to solve was not as easy, right? That's not where Cassandra can just apply this. And the reason is we have a fairly large Ruby and Rails install uh, that manages our four billion contacts on behalf of our customers. And CRM systems are typically at least semi-relational in nature, right? You have to do queries for partial data. You have to do joins across different types of data. And Cassandra, not an appropriate solution for the use cases we needed to implement here. And at four billion contacts, it's no longer trivial, right? Uh, it's many terabytes of data. I think it's somewhere, and the context team is here, somewhere between 10 and 20 terabytes of data uh, across the production system. And it doesn't fit on the local SSD anymore either. We so we have Fusion SSD drives, 1.6 terabyte apiece. So we ultimately said, okay, we'll do what everybody does and we'll start sharding the data horizontally. And we built a complete new CRM system on top of it, replace the old code base and start from scratch. Any idea how long that took? We guess. Almost, almost three. Right. Uh, it's it's a lot of work, right? Specifically if you have half a million customers pounding away on the existing system at the same time. So today this has about 500 requests a second request, meaning RESTful API calls into the system and about 60,000 concurrent users working on it. And here's what this really looks like. Um, there are what we call a cell. There are 12 vertical stamped out solutions. There's everything down from the Ruby application servers Redis caches down to a pair of MySQL database servers, and there's a simple load balancing algorithm that spreads things out. And our friends at Facebook have told us earlier that, well, the, the random distribution is highly in inefficient. In our case, though, all the data that we keep is really on a per customer basis. There's very little cross correlation between the data. We keep it all separate. So, and if you have 600,000 across 12 servers, that works reasonably well. It works well enough that we don't have to do anything special, even though I find this graph distribution talk extremely fascinating. So, however, right, a couple of things happened here, right? Um, so, first of all, 
we have a lot of application servers for a terabyte and a half of data, and we're finding that, well, um, they're mostly idle, right? Um, and the reason is you have to have a lot of them because you have EV power in the database, database centers, you can do one stage rollout, so you have a lot of over provisioning, uh, and ultimately we're limited currently by the database scalability, but not from an I.O. perspective, but more really from a data volume perspective. So for us, that means we're looking at things like uh, sharding at the database tier within a cell, right? And when we got started three years ago, it was a pretty grim picture out there, right? Um, I mean, there was no MySQL fabric, and even there, there are still no Ruby drivers for it. Um, MySQL cluster doesn't work at all for what we're trying to do. Um, so we're experimenting uh, with sharding at the DB level, uh, and we're looking at everything from, well, future MySQL uh, fabric, we're looking at the typical vendors in that space that try to provide transparent sharding at the MySQL level for us so uh, that we can grow data volumes for our customers within itself because they're greedy. One of the problems here actually is, and this is where we're a little unique compared to some of the other companies out here, is the average customer at Constant Contact has maybe like about a thousand contact records in their little CRM database, but we have people that have three million, right? So there's an extremely large spread in regards to what are who our customers are, right? And some of them are small businesses and really only have a handful of employees but have gigantic databases that still need to work equally well on the system because we don't want to build special solutions for special customers. So pros and cons of MySQL sharding, so the, the multi-master replication across data center doesn't get any better with more instances. The operational overhead is a problem, but you can, if you really can figure out how to scale the, the database here independently, which is what we're trying to do here, it's pretty decent, right? And very straightforward, actually, if everybody understands. And then using newer tools, it can actually be transparent, right? And I bet you all the VoltDB guys are gonna have me call after this talk and say, we got this problem solved for you. <laughs> Happy to talk. Okay, so. <laughs> So this was a little, just a very high level overview, overview of what we're doing at Constant Contact. Any questions? No hard questions, please? Please? I was just curious if you had numbers on uh, before and after in terms of re-architecting latency and throughput. Sorry, second, I couldn't Did you, you have before and after numbers for the latency and throughput of your re-architected systems? Yeah, it's actually interesting, right? So you would think that, and we all know that a single monolithic system traditionally is from a single path performance perspective, always fast in a distributed system, right? You don't have to find the data, you have to spend multiple servers, which is why our, our Facebook graph guys are trying to co-locate as much data of the graph on one node. And so I, I think, uh, despite the fact that this is Ruby and Rails, which has a little bit of a stigma when it comes to performance and scalability, I think we have now achieved uh, a performance of the RESTful services, data sharded Ruby architecture, that is on average only about 25% slower than the previous monolithic GR Java EGB based, I know people are cringing here, uh, application. So it's actually, Pretty good, right? You have actually some of the context engineers here in the room, and they will tell you that this is indeed a lot of work, right? Um, there's a lot of hand tuning that goes into this, and uh, but I think it works very well now. Other questions? All right, thank you, guys.